thank you so much, and thank you to everyone for coming. Before starting, I've got a, uh, a few questions. Who here has been to the Middle East? Just a rough show of hands. Okay. Uh, who's been to Israel? Any of the Arab countries? And to Syria? Okay. okay. And now, who is here primarily because of an interest in the Middle East and all those issues? And then who's here for primarily an interest in photography? All right, and the truth, who's here just for good food? <laughs> so as an artist, my hope is that these images depicting the beauty of Syria um, and its people convey the humanity and warmth that we felt and experienced there and that they help open hearts here and minds as ours were, and maybe even encourage some of the people who didn't raise their hands about Syria to consider visiting. Now, my goal as a photographer is not just exoticizing or, or cool travel photography. I'm always interested in how America is perceived and our impact, you know, be it through war, foreign policy, culture. And I use these images to delve into my own and other people's perspectives, connections, and experiences, and then to share them. I want to pose some questions and facts that are, are complicated here today. So when I first showed Syrian images, I was surprised at the really strong reaction. See, there's a strong reaction. <laughs> in how some people viewed the work, um, which triggered my own issues about judgment and being judged and all this. So please bear with me, and I'll provide some context. Are the people here familiar with what a Rorschach test is? It's just ink on a piece of paper. And what you see is your interpretation of that ink. Here you've got a whole slew. Now these images of Syria that we're going to see are all Rorschach tests. What you see or experience in an image is what you bring to that image. That's what you're actually really seeing. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of pixels or dots on a screen or on paper. So we're going to go through a few images here preliminarily and just to get a sense of what you think is going on. You're in Syria, a red spot in Damascus on the wall. Burkid women, what does this mean or say to you? A big crowd with loud chanting coming from it. What's going on there? An imam preaching. Me being hoisted up there. What is going on? Why am I holding the camera? And then what is this all about? This presentation's complicated. It's not a travelogue or a pure photography show. I absolutely am not an expert and don't claim to have the answers. Although I believe that we each have our own narratives about Syria. My goal is to share through my photography how complex the situation is. The idea of looking at it from inside the other person's shoes. My belief that people are people, and that there is no they. That stereotypes are really dangerous and a very bad idea. And to show Syria is a fascinating and amazing place to visit. I also want to just say that these are my experiences, not what I'm holding out is to be truth. Now the good news here is that there's probably something in this presentation to offend everyone. You can be Jewish, you can be Arab, you can be Muslim, you can be Democrat, Republican, Christian which means hopefully it's balanced. <laughs> now, my background, I've been an entrepreneur, real estate developer, and investor, and I'm very active in a range of different making a difference organizations and projects, several of them related to the Middle East, working with business leaders on opposite sides of conflicts. I have three great kids, and I'm very happily married for 28 years to my wife, Patty, who I am so grateful for. She's my biggest fan, always supportive, and puts up with all the craziness that I do. So. Um, I'm a passionate traveler and photographer, 
and also relevant today, I'm an American Jew, which of course impacts my perspective. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, the first generation Eastern European parents who were immigrants. Uh, I was bar mitzvahed. I worked on a kibbutz near the Golan Heights in Israel for a summer. I've been to Israel a dozen times and met with then Israeli President Ehud Olmert and other leaders on both sides of this conflict in connection with the work I do. Now, our children were born in Bat Mitzvah, and our 18-year-old daughter was in Israel last fall studying Hebrew and is now in Cairo studying Arabic. So it's complicated. There's an important concept in Judaism called tikkun olam, or an obligation to heal the world. And as a kid in the 60s, I lived in an all-black community, and my parents were very involved and active in civil rights, which takes me to what I now do with YPO. Now, over the past 10 years, I've been working as a member through a group called Young Presidents Organization, or YPO, which is a network of over 17,000 CEOs in over 100 countries. Right after September 11th, a group of us said, wouldn't it be great if we could get our members from opposite sides of conflicts meeting and really talking to each other? So we created what we call the Peace Action Network within YPO and used forums or small intimate groups of 10 to 15 members who would meet and share on a totally confidential basis. Participation for many of the members who were CEOs of the biggest companies in the Middle East is actually illegal in many of the cases, both for the Israelis and in many of the Arab countries. These are not bystanders, but close friends very deeply impacted by the conflict. My Israeli friends, one of whose father was targeted in an assassination attempt and left quadriplegic by the terrorist Abu Nidal, a leader in the PLO and the Fatah Revolutionary Council. Another Israeli friend whose brother-in-law was murdered in a Tel Aviv cafe by a Palestinian suicide bomber. My Palestinian friend who was murdered, blown up in Amman, Jordan in the bombings there of three hotels by an Al-Qaeda affiliate. Another Palestinian friend who many times has had his home in Ramallah occupied by Israeli soldiers for weeks, his family forced to remain in one room. Another Palestinian, CEO of the largest company in the West Bank, having to rush out early from a dinner with Israeli CEOs in Jerusalem to get home before checkpoints closed, or he'd lose his right to go to Jerusalem in the future. I share all of this just to give some perspective on what we saw and experienced in Syria. In these forums, we did a very powerful exercise called In the Other's Shoes, where you present from the perspective of the other in the first person. For example, a Palestinian would explain as though he were the Israeli forum mate devastated by the loss. My brother-in-law was slaughtered in a suicide bombing with his body parts and blood all over the street, and go on to share the pain as though it were his own. An Israeli might talk about, my children watched me humiliated by Israeli soldiers screaming at me and kicking me out in the middle of the night of my own home for no reason. Amazing learnings came for everyone involved on both sides. That the Arabs, who in this group were all educated at top universities in the US or Europe, knew the Holocaust was an important historic event, but didn't understand the deep present-day trauma it still is for Jews, and believed that it was used more as an excuse today for justifying what they see as Israeli aggression. These are not Holocaust deniers like Iran's Ahmadinejad, but people who just didn't realize the deep psychological scar, that for Jews, the Holocaust is not just a historical occurrence, but a present-day fear. As a result, they better understand this paranoia and that it's only paranoia if they're not really out to get you and talk of driving Israel into the sea. On the other hand, the Jews and Israelis learned about the deep sense of victimhood the Arabs felt, bullied and subjugated by the Ottoman Turks, European colonial powers, and now, as they see it, by America and Israel. We learned from our Arab friends that the Arab street really believes they're not smart or competent enough, and these are their words, to have pulled off the complex September 11th terrorist attacks. That pilots for Middle East Airlines are all Europeans, not Arabs. 
They said, someone crazy enough to blow themselves up in a cafe, sure, we got lots of those, but capable of a highly coordinated attack, less likely. The point here is not the truth, but that this shows the same sense of fear, victimhood, and paranoia as is felt by Jews and Israelis. We learned things about how the Israeli flag was interpreted and that the Arabs truly believe that AIPAC and American Jews drive US foreign policy in their region. And we witnessed in those of Palestinian descent the sense of shame and impotence of sophisticated, tough business leaders who, despite their significant wealth and success, were brought to tears in these groups over the long-held key to the family home, passed down through generations that they cannot return to in Tel Aviv, Haifa, or Jerusalem. The issue in these forums is less trying to determine some absolute truth than understanding the other side's narrative, their story, their reality, and their truth, which is what drives them. Many concrete initiatives came out of those forums, which I'd be happy to talk about in the question and answer. Now, as a family, we've always been curious, really believing that seeing on the ground is the best way, wherever possible, to understand a situation. In 2000, we took our kids, then six, eight, and 10 years old, out of school and traveled in the developing world for a year. A very good friend uses the expression eyeball to eyeball as the best way to learn and have impact. We're firm believers in Mark Twain's quote, that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. So we travel to see and better understand. Through my Arab friends, I was encouraged to visit, and this March, we went, my whole family went to Syria and Lebanon for two weeks. Syria is very easy to visit for Americans. You just get a visa and go. There are no prohibitions based on religion or ethnicity, but we did have an issue caused by an Israeli stamp in Patty's passport, that, which I had stupidly failed to notice. That's a longer, very interesting and illuminating story as to what happened there, which I'd also be happy to share later if, if people have questions. So we arrived in Damascus for a midnight dinner, which began an amazing pattern of eating way too much delicious and inexpensive food. So where were we? Syria, Lib Lebanon, and Israel get a lot of press, but are not big or populous countries. Syria is mostly Sunni Muslim, but there's also a significant Shia and Alawite population, as well as Christian and Druze minorities. We visited Damascus, the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world, Aleppo, the largest city, Palmyra in the desert, and the amazing sights along the way. We were so happy to be in Damascus, and it really felt like being in the Middle East. So this is the old city of Damascus. This shop is selling hookah pipes, or shisha in Arabic, and it's used there to smoke flavored tobacco. Shop selling dry fruits and nuts. creating sand paintings in glass jars. A bakery making croissants, showing Syria's French colonial heritage. Christian iconography, 10% of Syria is Christian. And 87% is Muslim. The souk, or Middle Eastern market, the souk al Hamadeya in Damascus, and the Aleppo souk are among the oldest continuously operating markets in the world. Some images from that souk. Jewelry, a nut cart vendor. Vendors are hauling and hawking their wares with all different sights, sounds, and stuff. store. Rose petals, an amazing smell. 
interesting activities, glass blowing. Shop selling hijabs, which is a scarf worn as a head covering for modesty. Beasts of burden, both human and animal. Recycling at its best, used carpet being used to repair carpets, yarn. Tops of some of those shisha pipes. Using every last bit, these are fragments of sheepskin. And more smells, star anise. Just teeming with life and activity and exotic fascination. Now, these women were just outside the souk. So I asked what was going on here during our Rorschach test. In possible contrast to whatever you may have been thinking or assuming, this lingerie shop is one of the most busiest shops we found in the entire souk. We have a tendency to think of someone in a burqa, which is a covering that some Muslim wear, women wear for modesty, as different from other women. But all people are, and certainly can be, the same. Now, some photography issues. I usually try to interact and engage with people who are my subjects, but sometimes a candid with a long lens, as in this case, uh, works better, or discreet hip shots. The whole permission issue, by the way, as you're traveling is interesting, along with other questions of when not to shoot. When is it dangerous? You know, you're shooting with thousands of dollars of camera equipment, sometimes in very poor areas. Respecting the sacred. You don't want to offend anybody or, or their beliefs. Respecting privacy and cultural norms. A lot of ethical dilemmas. And I'm always trying to make those quick decisions, trying to capture like Bresson's decisive moment. Uh, for those who care, it's a Nikon D700, which is great in these low light markets and at night. And I do post production to like clean up or enhance, but no real content changes the images. I want to note also that here you're seeing a disproportionate representation of women wearing burqas, as that was what was interesting and different to me with my Western eyes and perspective which is sort of my bad or an apology for kind of exoticizing the country. Um, in fact, this is far more typical. Syria is the first Muslim country to ban the burqa as they're concerned that it encourages Islamic extremism. The ban takes place first in universities with plans to extend it to everyday life. This is not about freedom of religion as the country is 87% Muslim. But Syria, and this is important, is certainly not a theocratic Islamic state. If anything, the government is very worried about Islam as a competitor to state power. We then went to Umayyad Mosque, one of the largest and oldest mosques in the world. It's considered the fourth holiest place in Islam. For Muslims, it's like a pilgrimage to Lourdes, the Vatican, or the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Changing room, respect, like you'd have to put on to go into a synagogue, a kippah, or yarmulke. Inside the Umayyad Mosque. Now please look and compare these next two images. The first, you sort of see 20-ish people in what looks like a big, open, empty space. But that image, cropped tight, looks like a packed room, and some might even see it as ominous. You know, with all of our preconceived notions, this could be preaching extremism. Just be aware of the impression created in each case between this and this. Richard Avedon noted that all photographs are accurate. None of them is truth. I'm often uh, amazed, you know, we'll be traveling in a place and then you get the news stories at home about massive demonstrations. You know, there's like a great CNN camera angle on the 50 people out of five million in a city that are protesting something, and that becomes the story. We had dinner with the leading Syrian family, which had earlier helped us with our, our Israeli stamp issue. They hosted us to an 18-course meal. They teased us that in their culture, how much you eat 
is a sign of how much you love your host, proving the Jews and Arabs are exactly the same. <laughs> so we ate and ate and ate. Their businesses had been nationalized four times over the last 50 years. Life can be very difficult for the Syrian people, even at the absolute top. We also learned about an unintended consequence, one of many, of our foreign policy, our embargo, which is designed to put pressure on Syria. One of their companies is a software business which is flourishing because no international competition is allowed in. So we may try to do one thing, and it often has different effects. It's very complicated. Their daughter had studied at the American University in Beirut in Lebanon. And we asked her how she liked being in Beirut when she was at school versus in Damascus. And as a sense of what goes on there, she looked around the restaurant really nervously and whispered, you know, freedoms. She was referring to the freedom of speech and activity in Lebanon, whereas in Syria, she's constantly concerned about the secret police monitoring her. However, we have our own propaganda or messaging. This is a story where State Department employees got into trouble during a diplomatic and business mission to Syria for creating a calming or humanizing imp influence by tweeting, using Twitter, about how visitors can buy an American-style iced coffee in Damascus and how one of them had challenged the Syrian communications minister to a cake-eating contest. Not the State Department intended message right now that Syria is a dangerous place to avoid and be wary of. Now, Obama recently made a recess appointment of Robert Ford as ambassador to Syria, so there may be some changes going on there, but who knows. So what's going on here? This was another one of our uh, Rorschach tests. This image is through a grill of the citadel in Aleppo, one of the oldest and largest castles in the world dating back about 5,000 years. And there's the citadel from the outside. Here's another one of those images where we saw, and I was worried about what I thought was a dangerous demonstration or rally. Um, and I immediately warned my family. I moved into my you know, hyper mode. You know, we're Americans in Syria. We have to stay away. But I got curious. And I went closer. And it turned out to be a promotion for Mother's Day elegant chocolate gift giving. <laughs> now, we joined the celebration, which, because of my fears, we almost skipped and created a whole negative story about. Just kids having a great time celebrating chocolate, music, dancing. clowning around. Now this is me, photographed by my son, hoisting the crowd on their shoulders, like at a Jewish bar mitzvah wedding just without a chair. And you know, they were singing and dancing and I was holding up the camera. Someone had asked me, and this is one of the startling things that happened to me, was somebody asked me seeing this image, well, were they trying to take your camera? <laughs> no, 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 they weren't trying to take my camera. I just didn't want to, you know, it's heavy. I didn't want to break somebody's head or my camera. Um, and I just love the way the camera gives me a way to engage and really become a participant. So my two sons and I, Alex Ben and I, went to a bathhouse, Hammam el Nahasim, which dated back from the 13th century, while Patty and Katie went to another bath. We were the only Westerners, and this was our idea of a good time. <laughs> That is tobacco. <laughs> we also experienced what we called Syrian torture. I foolishly paid extra for the special. Now, the special in a bath out, as it turns out, is scalding hot water and a steel wool scrub. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> on television, on a more serious note, when we were in the bathhouse, there was a television going, and I saw images of Jerusalem with Hebrew captions coming from Israeli TV. Now, based on what they constantly saw in their media of bloodied Palestinians in Gaza, Lebanon, and even the West Bank, we were asked, and this was out of curiosity, not antagonistically, we were asked, why do Israelis like to kill women and children? This is what they were seeing constantly. 
I had difficulties actually explaining the concept of acceptable collateral damage being okay, even if it's hundreds of people, but suicide bombings or terrorism. It's a hard concept to communicate. We were told that if Palestinians had F-15s, then no one would be a suicide bomber. That evening, we had an encounter and a few-minute conversation with Syrian President Bashar Assad and his wife Asma at the Sisi House, uh, which is the restaurant identified in Lonely Planet as his favorite in Aleppo. So we figured, well, God, we didn't know that he was going to be there. Assad was an ophthalmologist in London until he was called home after the death of his brother, the then heir apparent, in a car accident. When his father, Hafez Assad, died in 2000 after 30 years of running the country, Bashar took over. Our meeting with them was great. They were both charming and gracious, but we were reminded of the fear they invoke when we had a follow-up call and the hotel concierge who was helping us was visibly shaken when the presidential palace switchboard, which we're calling, asked, how did you get this number? Everyone seems terrified of possible encounters with the police there. We actually had seen a lot of Bashar Assad. A lot. This is not a democracy. The family has run the country for 40 years. There's a personality cult around the Assads. His picture is always there. We joke that he must be the most photogenic face in the country, but of course, it's not funny. Although we saw almost no physical evidence of a lot of soldiers or checkpoints or security, Syria is definitely a very tightly controlled country and not great for civil liberties. But as a traveler, it's probably safer than downtown Boston to just be there. Where I, in downtown Boston, I would never leave my camera visible on the seat of a car when I go into a restaurant for lunch. And I did that all the time in Syria. And as a matter of fact, the driver said, if you want, I'll lock the door. I don't even have to do that. But if you want me to, I'll lock it. Um, so it's incredibly safe. But it's very complicated. Past President Hafez Assad killed 20 or 30,000 of his own people in Hama to put down an uprising, which if you're curious, I can also talk about that in the Q&A. We saw many other signs which were frightening to us as Americans. This sign reads 41 years to return to Jerusalem and an independent Palestinian state. An art competition about memories of Palestine by the Palestinian Association. And these signs, the perseverance of the people, Gaza was victorious, and partler, partners in victory, leaders and martyrs, which includes many suicide bombers and Khaled Mashal, who's the head of Hamas. There were many images here of Hassan Nasrallah, who's the Secretary General of Hezbollah, which the US, Egypt, Israel, Australia, and Canada all classify as a terrorist organization. But it's complicated. Most of the European countries do not. From in the other shoes perspective of the Syrians and much of the Arab world, Hezbollah is a resistance movement of freedom fighters seeking to liberate three million Palestinians under what they consider to be illegal Israeli occupation. Hezbollah first emerged in 1982 as a militia in response to the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. And they, they were fighting the Israeli occupation during the Lebanese Civil War. Since then, it's gotten a dominant position in, Israel, in Lebanon. As an important point of clarification and total confusion, Hezbollah is from the Shia branch of Islam versus the other major branch of Islam, which are Sunni, which do not get along. The Sunnis make up much of Syria, and more importantly, in terms of threats to the US, Al-Qaeda is Sunni versus Hezbollah, which is Shia. So it is very complicated to try to figure out what's going on. Hezbollah calls for the total elimination of Israel, which is certainly bad and is totally unacceptable. But the Syrians that we spoke with believe that Syria would kick them out or force them to change their charter in a moment in exchange for a peace deal with Israel. And here's what the peace deal per, per the Syrians revolves around. Throughout the trip, we heard from Syrians saying to us, now try again here to listen from the construct of their shoes. The Golan Heights is our land, seized in wartime, and Israel should give it back. 
We want to make peace with Israel in exchange for the Golan. And today, the Golan is strategically not nearly as important as to Israel's defense because you have long-range missiles. And the fact that it's fertile and a great sense, source of water, which is important as a natural resource in a desert environment, isn't a fair reason, they said, for continuing to occupy land seized. People are people, and operating from a place of fear, everything becomes a Rorschach test and very difficult to address. It's really important, though, to note that we were welcomed everywhere, even though we're Americans, from the country which had labeled them axis of evil and imposed embargoes, and Jewish, with their comment being that Jewish wasn't an issue, but that their experience or narrative and what they believe of Israelis trying to take their land makes them fear and hate what they call Zionists. That said, when a peace deal was imminent in 2000, shopkeepers in the Damascus souk were all studying Hebrew so that they could profit from welcoming the anticipated Israeli tourists. So much for deep-seated, you know, impossible to resolve conflict. We wanted experiences, so we went out into the desert by camel to a Bedouin family we spent a night with. We met the family and definitely experienced people as people. The son talked to us privately about the difficulty he was having with his father over wanting to marry his girlfriend, avoiding a traditional arranged marriage. So you really get to know some people. We had a great dinner. There's, I mean, it was amazing food, so much amazing food. Uh, we stayed in a Bedouin tent. And early in the morning, I took a walk, wandering about a half a mile out into the desert. Now some kids saw and ran toward me, which was very fortunate, because also running toward me were dogs. <laughs> this boy didn't even slow down. He just picked up and threw a stone like 150 feet hit the dog in the side, which you know, then ran away, led me back to his tent. Introduced me to his family, including their 10-day-old brother. And I was invited in for coffee. Then I went back to our own breakfast feast. Now, our visit to Palmyra took us very close to Iraq. By the way, another unintended consequence, the best thing we could ever have done for Syria was the Iraq War, which created a huge economic boom there. So leaving the complex political issues for the pure fun and excitement of travel and tourism, we love the experiences and serendipitous discoveries of travel. Incredible food. We did a cooking class. Visited Malula which is a mostly Christian city and the only place in the world where the branch of the Aramaic language spoken by Jesus Christ is still used today in regular conversation. Croc de Chevalier, a crusader fortress and one of the most important preserved medieval military castles in the world. Palmyra, which in Arabic is Tadmor, which is cited in the Bible as a desert city built or fortified by King Solomon. And Apamea, which are Greek ruins outside of Aleppo. At one point, it had over 30,000 elephants, mares, and stallions. Now it's deserted and totally amazing. Now in Greece or Italy, ruins like this would be packed with thousands or tens of thousands of tourists and there was no one there. And you just stumbled upon reconstruction going on. 
then you never know what you may find in the road. <coughs> Different load limits on trucks than we have. <coughs> now, Syria is not a hardship destination. In addition to our Bedouin tent, we definitely stayed in comfort at some incredible boutique hotels. This is the Hotel Talisman in the Jewish quarter of Damascus. The Hotel Monseria Palace in Aleppo, which had other guests who were far more recognizable. Now, this is Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, if like me, you don't really know your movie stars. Here again is Aleppo, an amazing panorama. The colors mimic the desert, and it's one of the oldest inhabited cities in the world, at least 4,000 years. It's at the end of what was the Silk Road. So Syria is a great tourism destination, safe, amazing food, inexpensive, fascinating history, and ancient and current culture. Beautiful, undiscovered, uncrowded, with welcoming, wonderful people. The faces of Syria. Thank you very much for coming and open to questions.